And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion in his name. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I am delighted to open stage one on the debate on the principles of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner's Bill. Uh, I thank uh, Margaret Mitchell, the Convener, and the Justice Committee for their scrutiny of the Bill uh, and for their stage one report on it. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their consideration uh, of the Bill. I commend the Justice Committee for taking evidence from a very wide range of stakeholders and individuals. I'm grateful to those stakeholders for their considered views that they offered at the committee. I very much welcome the committee's view that the establishment of an independent Scottish Biometrics Commissioner is both timely and necessary, and its recommendation that the general principles of the bill be agreed to. The committee made a number of detailed recommendations and comments in its report and called on the government to consider and to respond to these. Uh, the government is still reflecting on some of these points, but I hope the interim response, which I provided to the committee earlier this week, um, it provides a useful indication of the Scottish Government's position. I will issue my final response next week. In this afternoon's debate, I want to focus on the principles of the Bill, uh, what we want to achieve through it, uh, though of course I will try to address some of the more significant points that the committee raised. Uh, by way of uh, background, by introducing the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner's Bill, the Scottish Government is recognising the need for transparency and accountability in how biometric data is used, in the, in the context of policing and criminal justice, and how important these are to building uh, and maintaining public trust. We live in times of rapid technological change where the development of new biometric techniques continue to evolve. Uh, scientific innovation in policing has the capacity to make us safer, but it also raises very pertinent questions about ethics, lawfulness, and privacy. Uh, therefore, we should recognize that public confidence requires that fundamental rights and the rule of law are both respected and, importantly, seen to be respected. With this in mind, this bill creates an independent commissioner to ensure that the approach to biometric data is effective, is lawful and is, ethico and is ethical, and to ensure that an appropriate balance is struck between communi keeping communities safe, respecting the rights of the individual and improving the accountability of the police. I cannot stress enough how important it is that we equip our police officers with the necessary technology to ensure they can keep us safe. However, let me equally stress how important it is that the public have absolute confidence in those technological advances and how their data will be collected or retained. This bill, the Commissioner and the Code of Practice will help provide those reassurances. The new Commissioner's general function is to support and promote the adoption of lawful, ethical, and effective practices in relation to collection, use, retention, uh, and of course, disposal of biometric data in the context of policing and criminal justice. justice. <clears throat> this function is to be carried out by keeping under review relevant law, policy, and practice, by promoting public awareness, and promoting and monitoring the impact of a code of practice. I'll turn first to the scope of the oversight arrangements contained in the bill. These currently apply to Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority, but I intend to broaden the scope by bringing forward amendments at stage two to also include the, the PERC, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. This is to recognise that it manages biometric data in the course of its investigations. Uh, the Justice Committee will also be pleased to hear that I'm actively considering the inclusion of cross-border devolved policing bodies such as the British Transport Police, the Ministry of Defence Police, and the National Crime Agency. I want to speak now about the Commissioner's public awareness raising function. Uh, given the explosion in biometric data and technologies in recent years, it's all the more important that we have an independent Commissioner who will lead a national conversation about rights, responsibilities and standards. Uh, the Justice Committee has asked how that conversation can be progressed. I see really a golden opportunity here for the new Biometrics Commissioner to link up with other Commissioners uh, such as the Information Commissioner and the Scottish Human Rights Commission to perhaps take forward uh, a national campaign. I, I now want to turn to the Code of Practice and the associated functions and powers of the Commissioner. Uh, the Justice Committee have raised a number of questions and recommendations on these to topics. I'll address some of these now. I, I welcome the Committee's support and principle for the requirement to have a code which the Commissioner will prepare and promote. 
I envisage that the Code will set out the standards and responsibilities of Police Scotland and the SPA with the aims of ensuring good practice, driving continuous improvement and enhancing accountability. The Code will be subject to consultation and to the approval of both the Scottish Ministers and, crucially, the Parliament. But let me clear up a misunderstanding here. The Code is already being put on a statutory footing. The Bill includes a number of statutory provisions about the Code. For example, it requires the Commissioner to prepare and review a Code. It requires there to be a consultation on the content of the Code. And it requires specified policing bodies to have regard to the Code. The Bill, therefore, already delivers on the Committee's recommendation that the Bill should establish a statutory basis for the existence and application of the Code. It is the content of the Code that is not specified in the Bill. This is to allow for flexibility and future proofing and to ensure that the Commissioner may act in a way that is, in, is impartial and allows them to use their own judgment. The Committee's recommendation around using the Independent Advisory Group's Code as an interim code I know was well-intentioned, but I feel that the specification of the Code by anyone other than the new Commissioner would undermine the key principles of impartiality and statutory consultation. I believe that the better solution here is to let the Commissioner undertake the process of preparing the Code in the way which the Bill currently specifies, which includes, of course, consultation, so that we have a Code which is fully formed and up-to-date um, and, as I say, which has been informed by the view of relevant parties. Yes, of course. Liam McCarthy. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for uh, giving way and explaining his rationale around the Code of Conduct. Would you not accept that the IAG, in drafting uh, the Code of Conduct, um, were seeking views uh, and the expertise from the, the stakeholders that he insists would need to be uh, consulted uh, on such a Code? Yeah, yes, Excuse I, me, I, I Cabinet Secretary, I just sneeze at the microphone. Sorry it's about okay. that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I do accept that. Uh, and there's nothing, of course, stopping the Commissioner, the new Commissioner, uh, having regard to the IAG's uh, code uh, of practice, uh, consulting with IAG uh, members and so on and so forth. I just wouldn't want to um, uh, pin, pin, pin them into that corner. Uh, I think the, the new Commissioner should have the flexibility uh, but also I think it's important because the Commissioner is going to, of course, be genuinely independent and therefore for, for, for him or her to have that independence, uh, they should be allowed to develop the code in a way that they see fit. Uh, but, it, but he's right to mention the fact that the IAG, of course, uh, did consult with a number of the relevant parties. <clears throat> Let me now turn to the Commissioner's powers. To enable the Commissioner to effectively perform uh, his or her functions, they will have the power to require police bodies to provide information. A failure to provide information to the Commissioner can be referred to the Court of Session for Enforcement. The information gathered by the Commissioner will allow the Commissioner to prepare and publish reports that will be laid before Parliament containing recommendations directed to the police bodies listed in the Bill. Those bodies can be required to respond publicly to a recommendation and, if they fail to do so, the Commissioner could publicise such a failure. The ability to draw Parliament's and indeed the public's attention to the activities of police bodies should not be, and I'm certain is not, underestimated. The Justice Committee is content with... Yes, I will. Don Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention on that point. I, I plan to mention this in my speech. Or what you could do instead is just have it a requirement to adhere to, and there'd be none, no need for any of this. We know that judicial... Uh, review, for instance, is not a simple process. Surely, with any piece of legislation, it, there can be discretion afforded decision-making within it, but just have it compulsory. Now, before you respond, I know I'm on my hobby horse, but what word you, did you use there you shouldn't have used? Yes, we're not going to use the term you, are we? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> That's a punishable offence uh, by, by Mr Finney, I'm certain. Um, in terms of his substantial point, I was just about to come to why I think that approach would be the, the, the wrong one. I, I will continue, uh, as I said, I think, in a meeting uh, with the member. Um, I will continue to, to keep an open mind, but uh, why I'm not persuaded yet, uh, I want to come to that point. And I thought the evidence from the Commissioner in England and Wales was quite compelling uh, when the Commissioner came in front uh, of 
the Justice Committee, the Biometrics Commission of England and Wales, told the Justice Committee, and I'll quote direct, the police are sensitive about carrying the public with them. Uh, that means that when we visit, they are always extremely open with us. We always have open discussions, and they're always amenable to our suggestions about their compliance. And the basic reason if they want to continue uh, is that they want to continue to hold public trust. The Commissioner then went on to talk about what a different dynamic there would be if there was a requirement as opposed to, to, to a duty to have regard to. And he thought, the Commissioner thought, uh, that that change in dynamic would be extremely uh, unhelpful. I'm also of that view, and I think all of us understand that the police are under a great deal of scrutiny, as they rightly should be, something I completely uh, agree with, and I know the police uh, agree with. They have scrutiny from HMICS, they have scrutiny from the Subcommittee on Policing, from the Justice uh, Committee, from this Parliament uh, more broadly, more widely. Uh, they have accountability to the SPA, the PERC, of course, uh, Audit Scotland and so on and so forth. Uh, and so therefore, um, I think uh, they are very aware of that public scrutiny and attention and the importance that they put on taking the public with them, uh, I think is, is, is an important dynamic uh, which I wouldn't want to, 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 to see necessarily change. But I will uh, listen to what the member has to say and what the Justice Committee uh, has to say uh, in that regard. But it is important to also... Uh, be firm that there are consequences um, if, if a recommendation by the commissioner uh, is ignored. Uh, a number of consequences might occur. The situation can be reported to parliament, which not only then makes it public, but incurs reputational damage. But the body in question also may be called to account to this parliament. In fact, dare I say it, to the subcommittee convened uh, by the member. Uh, also, the Commissioner may decide that lack of cooperation has highlighted the need for a full review or indeed the need for legislative change. And if that was a recommendation that a Commissioner made, then of course we would be open to, 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 to that suggestion. So therefore, the lack of regard to the Code or to a recommendation from the Commissioner uh, may well have far-reaching consequences. Uh, and I hope the Justice Committee will feel reassured by this, but I suspect it will be a continual uh, matter of debate as we progress to stage two and stage three of this bill. In conclusion, presiding officer, uh, as the committee recognises, the role of biometrics is fast becoming a central element of the way in which Scotland is policed and crime is investigated and prosecuted. And as the Commissioner for the Retention of Biometric Material observed, many countries are looking at what Scotland is doing through this very bill. I want to put Scotland at the forefront of driving forward transparency, accountability, an improvement in relation to biometric data for policing and criminal justice purposes. That is why the architecture of the bill allows flexibility, why the definition of biometric data is broadly drawn, and why the Commissioner's powers and functions are focused on rights and responsibilities. The bill creates a biometric Commissioner for modern times who will operate in a fast-changing world, but always with a focus on our rights, our safety, and our expectation of transparency in policing and the criminal justice system. Uh, I look forward to working with members of all parties to secure these objectives as we continue to take the bill through Parliament. And I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. Thank you very much. And I now call Margaret Mitchell to open on behalf of the Justice Committee. Convener, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak as the convener of the Justice Committee on the Scottish Biometrics Com uh, Commissioner's Bill. I start by expressing my thanks to the Justice Committee members and clerks for their hard work and to all the witnesses who provided evidence as part of our scrutiny of the bill. The last 25 years has seen a digital revolution with technology now central to the way we live. This impacts on how the police investigates crime. The bill establishes a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner and a statutory code of practice to provide oversight for the collection, use, retention and disposal of biometric data in the context of policing and criminal justice. The committee welcomes the bill, but as ever, the devil is in the detail. The oversight system the bill creates sets the blueprint for Scotland's response to the growing influence of biometrics. 
the committee agreed that the bill must set out clearly the principles which should underpin this oversight and the promotion and protection of human rights, privacy, public confidence and community safety are crucial. So it's disappointing the government's response to our report does not support the specific inclusion of these principles in the bill. The committee believes the bill must provide the commissioner with the necessary powers to hold the police service to account for its use of biometrics and to ensure compliance with the code of practice. This is absolutely vital to ensure public confidence and trust in the use of biometrics by the police and by the criminal justice system. The committee agrees that the Scottish Biometrics Commissioners should be independent of the government and appointed by the SPCB, should be able to scrutinise biometric processes adopted by all those who provide policing within Scotland and those who share biometric data with the police, Police Scotland, including the British Transport Police and the National Crime Agent, Agency. At present, other public sector and private sector bodies are collecting and sharing biometric data without regulation. There is a lack of transparency here which requires to be addressed urgently. The bill only proposes the Commissioner has oversight of Police Scotland and the SPA at a time when public concern over the use of biometrics is growing. Witnesses suggested a wide-ranging debate on this issue to be led by the new Commissioner. The, the committee urges the government to fully meet its policy intention of providing confidence to the public by extending the debate to apply to all those who collect biometric data in Scotland. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary, re Secretary's recognition of this need and call on him to support the Commissioner in leading this debate. Members unanimously support the Code of Practice to be established by the Commissioner and that the Code is considered and improved by the Parliament. Given the far-reaching human rights, ethical and privacy issues relating to the use of biometrics for criminal justice and policing purposes, the lack of powers for the Commissioner to ensure compliance with the Code raises concerns. Whilst name and shame is a key approach taken to oversight of the 43 police forces in England and Wales, there is only one police force in Scotland and the committee considers this approach is not vi a viable option open to the new commissioner under the code of practice. The committee considers the commissioner must have the powers to enforce any compliance which may be needed. Equally, we recognise there may well be exceptional circumstances where the police are not able to comply with the code. The committee therefore recommends, and there was lengthy discussion on this, the have regard to approach be reviewed in the light of experience and that the commissioner report to the parliament on its effectiveness. I note the government's view that the commissioner should explore procedural changes with Police Scotland or recommend new legislation to strengthen the observance of the code, but these are far from ideal options. Another key concern raised in evidence was the lack of a complaint mechanism in the bill. It is essential that people are able to complain about their biometric data, data being taken or used without their consent. The committee recommends the bill provides a complaint mechanism to allow the Commissioner to deal with complaints from the public. And it's disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary is opposed to this recommendation. Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Thank um, the Convener for, for giving way. Um, does the Convener recognise that it's very important for us to not stray into the reserve functions of the Information Commissioner and that as things stand currently, that if anybody has a complaint in Scotland about how their data is being used or concerns if it's being misused, then they can, as things stand, go to the Information Commissioner for that complaint to be investigated. Margaret Mitchell. Cabinet Secretary, this, is all, this bill is all about transparency, the collection of uh, more biometric data for 
for individuals, very personal information here. And if we are to have trust, and this is going to be successful, then the public must have a mechanism to complain. And I do urge him and hope he will reconsider this when we look at stage two and three. The use of technology which impacts on the rights of individual must always be justified and proportionate. Members stress the bill must ensure that police always adopt an ethics centre's approach to the use of new invasive technologies. The Commissioner will have a key role to play in exploring whether the use of new technologies is necessary and justified and in ensuring that technology is used within the principles which, under my, which underpin the oversight mechanism. The committee recommends the bill provides for an ethics advisor group to assist the commissioner and that the group be appointed by the commissioner and be independent of government. I'm sorry to see the cabinet secretary rejects a statutory basis for such a group. The cabinet secretary re recently announced plans to establish an independent chaired ethics group to advise the government and it would be helpful if he could be clear that the ethics group for the commissioner would be separate from any appointed by him. Serious concerns were also expressed about private companies who collect and share biometric data with the police and public sector use of biometrics such as parole e-monitoring and local government CCT systems. Here, the bill provides very few, if any, reassurances. The committee therefore recommends that the Scottish Government review provision of the scope of the Commissioner's remit and powers after a suitable period of time, that the Commissioner reports to the Parliament annually on the adequacy of the resources provided to their office, and that the Scottish Government must review the Commissioner's funding in cooperation with the SPCB. I note the government's comments on a review of funding and post-legislative scrutiny. However, we should not rely on post-legislative scrutiny. We should aim to get the red, this legislation right first time. Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee considers the bill will require to be strengthened at stages two and three, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary to rethink some of his objections to our recommendations. In the meantime, the committee welcomes the bill and recommends the Parliament agrees its general principles. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. And I call on Liam Kerr to open the Conservatives. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to open this Stage 1 debate into the proposed Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill on behalf of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. With the avoidance of doubt, like the committee, my colleagues and I are supportive of the principles of it and shall vote accordingly at decision time. And at the outset, let me echo the convener's thanks to the clerks for pulling together a great deal of information on what is a complex area into a comprehensive, clear and very accessible report. The principles of this bill are sound to address ethical and human rights considerations in Scotland relating to the collection, use, retention and disposal of biometric data in the context of policing and criminal justice. It seeks to do this by establishing the post of a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner who will oversee the use of biometric material and draw up and promote the use of a code of practice which will govern how biometric material should be used and gathered. It also seeks to underpin public trust in the way the police use biometric data, which is a key point that I shall return to shortly. Now, I've set this out in that way because I think that that scope raises a number of considerations which have been highlighted in the committee's report and which bear further examination as this bill progresses. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, what will determine the success of this bill, both in the immediate but also in the medium and longer terms, lies, I think, in the resourcing of it. The committee's report is clear that one of the key concerns raised by witnesses centres around the level of resources required to allow the Commissioner to operate effectively. The report states clearly that other SPCB supported office holders have faced resourcing issues as a result of changes or expansion to their role and powers over time, or as a result of growing demand for activity. Now, by its very nature, 
This is a rapidly developing and changing environment, which is likely to see an increase in activity. And the report's conclusion was stark. The committee is concerned that the financial memorandum may not sufficiently estimate the resources which may be needed to support the delivery of the commissioner's functions. And in the same vein, the Law Society have made a useful and uh, I think important submission to this debate and specifically highlight that not only should the role be, as they put it, appropriately funded, but that that funding must continue at an acceptable level to allow for the inevitable mission creep. They say only in that way can the Scottish Commissioner be able to ensure that they can properly fulfil their functions and be appropriately accountable. Which is why the Cabinet Secretary's response to the report is somewhat concerning uh, when he says the provision of further resources will be subject to wider public spending pressures and will be considered as part of an annual budget setting process. Of course, but that isn't a cast iron commitment to ensure either appropriate or continued funding as the role inevitably enlarges. On another matter, the committee is right to highlight at paragraph 86 that biometrics use goes far beyond Police Scotland and the SPA, for example, and especially into education and the NHS. There is a public need and a public good in seeking to regulate biometrics in this way, and there is a pressing need for transparency. So what do we do about that? Well, the committee called for a, a public debate, but at the very least, the code of practice ought to address how the commissioner will interact with private sector users of biometrics. I note again the Scottish Government's response, which is encouraging. Uh, but loads a great deal of responsibility onto the Commissioner, which of course takes us back to the resourcing, both initially and going forward. And this of course all leads to concerns around enforcement. I recall the Committee being concerned around whether there should be a duty to comply with the Code as opposed to to have regard to. The Convener highlighted that the Committee felt that the enforcement powers are insufficient, which could undermine public confidence. And that I think merits further consideration, although I recall the Cabinet Secretary arguing his case persuasively in the committee, uh, and do note his letter of the 7th of January. But the review talked of just now by the convener would seem sensible in my view. But if public confidence is a key aspect of this bill, I do think that the absence of a complaint mechanism, for example, to enable the public to refer issues to the Commissioner for lack of compliance with the Code, perhaps, is regrettable. In committee, many witnesses brought it up and specifically said that there is a risk to public confidence and transparency if a complaint mechanism is not included in the bill. I find that persuasive. Now, of course, I hear the point that the information commissioner's office, uh, about the information commissioner's office, but I do think that the new biometrics commissioner will want to be engaged with the pub public and be available. One can just imagine a situation in which the new commissioner seeking to fulfill the public engagement or awareness role is approached by the public about an apparent breach but is required to send them away to the ICO, which I suggest does not lend itself to public trust and confidence. So yes, I accept the requirement in the Cabinet Secretary's response to develop a comprehensive communication strategy to understand the role, but I am less persuaded that there is not merit in including a direct complaint mechanism as the committee unanimously recommended. Presiding officer, my final point I owe to my learned friend, Gordon Lindhurst, who I expect will develop what I'm increasingly of the view is a key issue in closing. The Cabinet Secretary rightly raised the issue of enforcement, and I think it's worth exploring this further. Section 12.3b uh, of the bill allows the Court of Session to treat a failure to provide information to the Commissioner under Section 11 as a contempt of court. The drafting of this seems not only somewhat draconian, given the lack of similar provisions elsewhere, but also given the particular drafting, an individual will not know in advance whether or not an action will be contempt of court, unlike perhaps a situation where someone does know if ignoring a direct order of the court. And furthermore, the interplay between this section and section 11.3, under which a person is not obliged to provide information, which that person would be entitled to refuse to provide in proceedings in a court in Scotland, is, I would gently suggest, challenging. I'll leave it there uh, for both consideration by my colleague later and per perhaps review at stage two. But suffice to say, I confirm we will support the principles at stage one, and I look forward to cross-party collaborative working going forward to drive improvements 
into the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call James Kelly to open for Labour. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. I'm delighted to open the debate this afternoon for Scottish Labour. I uh, confirm that Scottish Labour will be supporting the general principles of the Bill at decision time this evening. Um, I also want to place on record, as other speakers have done, my appreciation of the work that the Justice Committee have done, that the clerks in particular have put in to compile in the report and the witnesses that also appeared be before the, the committee. I think the legislation that we have before us uh, is important. Uh, if you look at the background to biometric data and data and the importance of it in relation to policing and criminal justice, uh, it plays an absolutely central role uh, going back over 100 years. Um, police and uh, law enforcement agencies uh, have used data very effectively in order to prosecute, prosecute crime and bring those who have committed those crimes uh, to justice. Um, the data collection and the extent of data that is collected uh, has increased significantly, as, as Margaret Mitchell said, over the last 25 years, particularly with the, the, the vast improvements that we've seen in technology. And that is to be very, that's, that's very welcome uh, in terms of helping the police uh, do their job. We've seen numerous examples of cold case reviews that have allowed the police to go back and investigate crimes that had taken place you know, in the last 30, 40 years and bring forward to successful prosecutions as a result of improvements in biometric data techniques. Uh, as I say, that's very much welcome. Um, but at the same time, the, the breadth of collection of data, uh, the number of people that it, that, that it covers, uh, how that data is stored, how long it's stored for, uh, are, there are then central issues around that, both in terms of uh, people's human rights and also the, the, given the police and the prosecution authorities the ability to, to carry out their job effectively. I think in terms of the committee's report, so therefore it is absolutely essential that we establish an independent uh, biometric commissioner. In terms of the committee's report, there are three issues that uh, have come out and have already begun to play out in the debate this afternoon, and those are around the scope, the powers, and the access to the commissioner for uh, complaints. Uh, in relation to the scope, the, the, the scope is currently limited to Police Scotland and the SPA. Uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement this afternoon to extend that, that scope. Uh, however, uh, I do think that that should be examined, you know, to go further than that to public bodies such as the NHS and also to examine the way that some private bodies um, collect uh, and, and store data. Um, we did hear in evidence, you know, the concerns of the breadth of organisations that uh, are collecting biometric data and using it, uh, passing it to the police. And there's no doubt that that's going to continue to grow. So this is clearly an area that needs to be uh, examined further. Uh, in terms of the powers, the powers are obviously established through the, the Code of Practice, which the, uh, which the Commissioner will uh, move forward with. And a lot of the debate this afternoon has been already been around whether the provisions in the Bill currently are adequate. Uh, and there's been much discussion around the phrase have regard to and whether that is legally uh, adequate in terms of ensuring that people comply with the code of practice. Uh, I'm not persuaded that the, 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 the use of the phrase have regard to uh, is strong enough. Uh, I think you know, there needs to be something that's more uh, legally compliant. Um, for example, the cabinet secretary and I uh, although we agree on this legislation this afternoon, I've had numerous political disagreements over the years, and uh, I can have regard to the Cabinet Secretary's views on, say, the matter of the Constitution. It doesn't mean to say I have to follow them, 
uh, and I'll have to implement them in the, the speeches that I make in the chamber. So therefore, uh, you know, I think we need something that's going to be stronger if we're going to give the commissioner the powers that, that he needs to ensure that uh, the, the, the code of practice uh, doesn't become toothless. I think around access, it is important that the, uh, the, the, the public have a mechanism to bring forward complaints uh, properly. Um, you know, listen carefully to the Cabinet Secretary make a number of rep rep representations on this, but I still feel that the, the way the legislation's drafted currently, there's, there's, all, there's more needs to be done in terms of public awareness, and there's more needs to be done to allow people to bring complaints if they feel that their human rights are uh, being compromised in any way. Uh, and I emphasise, as I said earlier, that this is becoming a, a much bigger area. Um, I think the, the other area that the, is, is going to be crucial in the, the bill going forward, uh, and I, you know, I think the balance that the bill is drafted you know, currently uh, is reasonable, is in terms of in, uh, being able to cater for future developments. This is an area that is going to expand greatly in the coming years and the code of practice needs to be able, and the commissioner need to be able to take uh, account of any future developments in technology. Uh, and summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, welcome the principles of the, the bill. It's very important that we have a biometric uh, commissioner who's independent. I think there are issues that have come out in the Justice Committee's report uh, around the scope of the Commissioner's role, the powers that he has in access, and I think, I hope the Cabinet Secretary takes on board some of the views that have already been expressed this afternoon. Uh, and I'm sure if there aren't appropriate changes uh, ahead of stage two, members across the Chamber will bring forward uh, amendments to seek to strengthen this bill to make it more effective and more robust. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. I now call John Finney to open for the Green Party. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Mr Finney, um, when you're ready. <laughs> yes, no, I'm, I'm grand. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, and just to, to, to advise that the Scottish Green Party will be supporting the general principles of this uh, uh, legislation at decision time. And to thank, as others have, all those who have been involved in the process. And um, it's, it's, it's been a, a thorough examination that's gone in, and particularly to the clerks for the compilation of, of the report. Thanks to all those who have provided briefings, including Amnesty, and I refer people to my members' register of interest as a, as a member of Amnesty. I want to talk about paragraph 87 in our report, where, as a committee, um, we ask the Scottish Government to consider, and the, the convener did allude to this, how the lack of debate and transparency on the issue of biometrics across Scotland might be addressed, and what role the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner could play in that. Now, the, the Scottish Government response um, in yesterday or the day before was that uh, the Biometrics Commissioner would be, quote, best placed to lead the debate. I don't agree on that. Um, I think leaving it all to the Biometrics Commissioner would be inappropriate. Um, as the convener and indeed others have said, this is a fast-moving situation. Um, and it may seem strange to say we need debate when we're actually debating the subject, but we need a lot more debate on this whole issue for the very reasons that members have outlined with regard to technology. The Scottish public are under a heavy degree of surveillance, and we've seen, and I'll not dwell on it, but we've seen with the issue of the digital triage devices, the, the cyber kiosks deployed without assessment, without a, a robust legal basis, a little, if any, oversight by the SPA, and how public rights could have been eroded there. I have to say, Police Scotland have responded extremely positively and, and engaged with others. And uh, um, that situation's moved on. The police subcommittee are now looking at facial recognition um, uh, issue, and that's something that would very clearly fall within the Biometrics Commissioner's re remit, and we know already in relation to this that there is a live challenge ongoing elsewhere in these islands. So um, I welcome the contributions we've had from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Open Rights Society, Big Brother Watch, the Impanation Commissioner, various academics that have informed this, and, and to commend the role that the Independent Advisory good, good Group have played throughout this, and commending uh, an Ethics Advisory Group to continue 
um, when this legislation passes. And I believe that should be on the face of the bill. Now, our stage one report alluded to facial recognition, facial search technology, gait and movement recognition technology, eye retinal identification, voice recognition software, as well as data from social media capable of providing biometrics sources to the police. I'm told second generation biometrics is what that it's called, so we do need a very robust oversight, and uh, I recall uh, in a different capacity at the time when the introduction of CTV, CTV um, was trialled in Airdrie, yes, in the 90s, um, and the issues still remain largely the same. Who undertakes the role, the role of the, the police and the, the private sector, for what purpose, who has oversight of it, who has access to the material, and how long it's retained. And it's Parliament that must lead that debate along with our country's justice system, and I'm sure Police Scotland and the, the prosecution, the Crown Prosecution Service would welcome discussions on this, because it's key that all of us protect the citizens' right, because if we don't, who does? Uh, the Code of Practice has been al alluded to, and, um, um, and it's intended to, to set out some of the, these issues. The Scottish Human Rights Commission, in their submission, written submission, uh, highlighted that, for instance, the issue of a, a, a detailed analysis of deletion was, that was part of the uh, independent assessment group's initial report was, has not been picked up in this. And uh, what we do know in, uh, in the course of our deliberations was that data already in the protection of Police Scotland and the SPA is not all legitimately held. This was alluded to at paragraph 132, um, and we refer to it as a legislative gap. Now, the Scottish Government's response, and I'll read it as, since the publication of the 2016 HMICS review on the use of facial research functionality within the UK Police National Data Police, S Police Scotland have successfully delivered a new custody, a national custody episode management system which enables custody images to be automatically weeded from that system when the corresponding image is similarly deleted from the criminal history system. Now, um, it's unclear to me what that's supposed to mean. My understanding was that for technical reasons, um, uh, photographic uh, details of people who had been acquitted re remained on the system. Now, if that's been corrected since 2016, that's very good. That's very good. But perhaps that's something that at some point the Cabinet Secretary could under um, um, outline to, to us, please. The legislation covers Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. Um, my view all along has been that with everything else, and I, I have a frustration that we have a number of police services operate in Scotland that are not accountable to this Parliament, British Transport Police, National Crime Agency being two, um, never mind some of the other UK ones that will be more challenging to deal with. So I welcome that the Cabinet Secretary is wanting to include British Transport Police and the National Crime Agency. I wish you luck trying to get this UK Government to agree the Ministry of Defence piece. Uh, I hope that they will. Um, I hope people will support the uh, Section 104 orders. But if that's not secured, then it's not all of policing that's covered by this. It's simply the principal police force and the principal people who hold the information. And of course, what we have is a situation where it's not just public bodies that, that hold information. Um, public space CCTV systems, road camera enforcement systems, automatic number plate recognition, all of which can capture the facial images of citizens engaged in routine lawful activity. So um, the Open Rights Group um, uh, refer us to the European Court of Human Rights, which said, quote, any state that claims a pioneer role in the development of new technologies bears a special responsibility for striking the right balance. And that is about the uh, uh, scrutiny that goes into who has what, who has access to it, and all the rest. So whether that's schools with the biometric information they have, uh, the, uh, the gold card collection, as I understand it's referred to, which is uh, information held by the, 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 uh, the um, National Health Service. Um, Amnesty say the regulation of biometrics outside of policing, including the private sector, is challenging but vital, and the government should consider how best to achieve this. The bill is presently configured, it won't do that, um, and uh, uh, I also want to just briefly return to the issue of have regard to, because like James Kelly, I have regard to a lot of things. I've had a lot regard to uh, advice about dietary um, um, conditions, um, but I'll overgo the... Um, public, what was the term you, you used indeed, reputational damage, of not having adhered to that advice. So I think we should get it right first time. There shouldn't be any problem whatsoever by a policing service saying if the person engaged by this parliament to deliberate on decisions 
say something, please do it. There shouldn't be any decision. There should be no issue about that whatsoever. And this, the, the reality is that within any system of uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, there is flexibility day in, day out. Police make judgments about whether to take actions. Day in, day out, Crown Office, Procurator, Fisco, consider representations are made. So this shouldn't be punitive, but have regard to is, 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 is a, 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 I feel, a, a very unsatisfactory place. Um, we must, future proofing is an issue. Uh, the technology is far ranging and we must w watch out for the, the snake oil salespersons who are very happy to sell us technology um, which has a 2% success rate. That's the facial recognition technology. Police Scotland have no plans to introduce this at this time, but that's in the 2026 um, plan. So scrutin scrutiny of the technology as some of the representations we've had made should also be an important function of the Biometrics Commissioner and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we do have some time in hand, but let's not, I can't be over generous much through. It was interesting. And so, Mr. MacArthur, if you want to use up a wee bit extra time, then you fast yourself, you'll get it. Thank you. I will not uh, abuse that invitation. Um, like others, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly support the principles of this uh, focused but important bill. And uh, like others, can I uh, also pay tribute and uh, offer thanks to those who've helped the committee during our stage one uh, scrutiny. I also want to acknowledge uh, the contribution of John Scott QC, along with his colleagues on the independent advisory group, uh, who have done so much to lay the foundations uh, for the bill that we're considering uh, this afternoon. Mr Scott barely had time, I think, to draw breath uh, after digging the government out of the hole over unregulated stop and search before he's been invited to help shape the regulatory framework for the use of biometric data in Scotland. He and his IAG uh, colleagues certainly rose to that task, and I think it's important that Parliament now passes legislation that stays true to their recommendations. Uh, as I'll come on to explain uh, shortly, I don't believe yet that this bill does that uh, well enough. But first, though, uh, I, I want to take a moment to put this bill uh, in context. The term biometrics is the umbrella term for our most valuable personal uh, data, and therefore uh, we are looking at how to govern how accessible that is to others. In 2015, it emerged that pictures of 330,000 Scots who had been taken into custody had been made available to users of the police national database. These pictures could be accessed nationwide and included many people who had never actually done anything wrong. They were then analysed and consulted in criminal identification processes. This revelation kick-started a Liberal Democrat ca campaign spearheaded by my former colleague Alison McInnes to effectively protect people from the unregulated use of biometrics. He wrote to the First Minister at the time demanding a review of facial recognition technology, prompting the announcement of a review by HMICS. During the passage of the 2016 Criminal Justice Act, Alison McInnes lodged amendments that would have subjected the collection of biometric information to the same rules as DNA and fingerprints. Uh, this would have uh, required information to be, quote, destroyed as soon as possible following a decision not to institute criminal proceedings against the person or on the conclusion of such proceedings. Two independent expert reports from HMICS and the advisory group then agreed that fresh legislation and oversight was required. Uh, while it has taken time for the government to bring forward this bill, Scottish Liberal Democrats, as I say, clearly welcome it, as we do the creation of a biometrics commissioner to oversee the collection, use, retention and deletion of biometrics. Restricting the remit to policing, however, is problematic. As the committee heard repeatedly during our evidence sessions, uh, biometrics is increasingly being used across a range of different areas, both public and private. While there is obviously a significant challenge to ensuring any regulatory framework keeps pace with technologies that are evolving at a bewildering pace, I believe Open Rights Group, um, Amnesty and others are right in calling for the scope of the Commissioner's role to be extended. Let's not forget that the IAG recommended that the Commissioner should have oversight of biometrics used by police, SPA and other public bodies. And while the Cabinet Secretary uh, has informed us that uh, he plans to extend it to cover Perkin, I very much welcome uh, that confirmation. And he does suggest that he's prepared to keep uh, an open mind in relation uh, to wider extension. This bill uh, needs to be more specific about how uh, this can be made to happen. As various witnesses told the committee, it's not unreasonable to be aiming for the Commissioner's role to cover the use of biometrics by public authorities and private actors uh, where it is being used uh, on the general public. 
That may be in other parts of the justice system uh, or indeed areas such as education and health uh, where we're seeing biometrics increasingly used. This, I think, reflects both the public mood and expectation. And of course, there's a balance to be struck between public safety and giving the police the tools they need in order to do the job uh, that we require of them on one hand, but individual rights, not least the right to privacy. And I give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Lee MacArthur uh, for giving way? I, I will address the substantial point about potentially broadening uh, in, in the future. But does he recognise that data, biometrics data, that is retained, uh, collected and retained by police and the SPA for policing and criminal justice purposes is very unique in its own right because often, for example, that data could be taken without the consent of the individual if needed for crime investigation purposes. Therefore, the focus on policing and criminal justice is the right place to start because of the very unique nature of that data that's collected. Liam McArthur. I, I absolutely don't dispute that at all and, and uh, in a sense nor would I dispute that that is perhaps the, the, the area of priority but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're seeing this technology uh, increasingly used and deployed in, in other areas the, of, of the public realm as well. Um, we're already seeing, as I say, uh, public concern, um, for example, around the issue of live facial uh, recognition technology referred to by John Finney and others. These technologies are increasingly being trialled and used by police to monitor public spaces and we must be very wary of what can amount to indiscriminate mass surveillance, not least given the inaccuracy of the technology. In their briefing, Amnesty referred to analysis that shows these technologies generate false positives in around two-thirds of cases, uh, but the Met has uh, put that figure as high as 80% with particular problems in matching images of those from the BME uh, community. And clearly, this is no basis for any sort of rollout of this technology at this point. The lack of legislative framework, transparency, potential for discrimination, absence of public information and rights of review or appeal point to the use of such technologies and retention of Im images as potentially unlawful. Uh, that issue of review or appeal is picked up by the Law Society who argue that uh, for public confidence, a complaint mechanism should be included within the bill to enable the public to refer issues to the Commissioner on the use of biometrics and where there's a lack of compliance with the Code of Practice. As for that code, a draft of which was drawn up by the IAG, uh, the committee concluded this should be on a statutory footing and come into force at the same time as the Commissioner takes up office. The Law Society suggests that this would, uh, for example, avoid the need for speculation as to what the Code might uh, or will include. Disappointingly, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, rejected those calls, something I'm sure the committee will return to uh, at stage two. Likewise, the Cabinet Secretary appears determined to do his own thing when it comes to the Ethics Advisory Group. John Scott and his colleagues recommended the establishment of such a group as part of oversight arrangements. The remit would be to work with the Commissioner and others to promote ethical uh, considerations in acquisition, retention, use and disposal of biometric technologies uh, and data. The Government accepted that recommendation but has failed to put it in the Bill and again that is disappointing and needs addressing. Finally, on the question of enforcement powers, the Government has argued that the threat of naming and shaming is in itself sufficient. The committee wasn't convinced, nor indeed were many of those we took evidence from, and again, this will be something I'm sure we return to at stage two. More encouragingly, I note the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to consider amending the bill to include regulating powers so that biometric data can be uh, defined and subsequently updated, and that uh, is very much welcome. Deputy President Officer, Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, have led the way over the past five years in campaigning for proper regulation of the use and retention of biometric data, including the establishment of a biometrics commissioner. On that basis, we warmly welcome this bill, uh, but believe there is more work to be done uh, to ensure that it is up to the formidable task required of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr MacArthur. Now moving to open debate, there is a little time in hand. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Shona Robertson. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, technology and biometrics is advancing at breakneck speed and we must be prepared for it by introducing a sensible framework of legislation to enable the police to detect, prevent and prosecute crime. That's why I'm pleased to support the general principles of the Scottish Biometric Commissioner's Bill today. Can I also thank the Clarks and Bill team for their hard work in collating the evidence we heard from a variety, a variety of excellent witnesses and can I thank those witnesses for helping us with their expertise in this field. Presiding officer, the written and oral evidence that the committee received showed broad support for the establishment of a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner. 
And of course, it's important that we have the public support and confidence in the use of this new technology. That's why a new independent and expert commissioner is pivotal to achieving this and to help us ensure that the use of biometric data in criminal justice and policing is effective, lawful and ethical. The scope of the bill covers the acquisition, use, retention and disposal of biometric data, including fingerprints, DNA and current emerging techniques such as iris recognition, all necessary to keep communities safe and help police fight in their fight against crime. In my view, this is an example of using technology for the best purpose, but of course human rights and data protection requirements do pose a challenge and must be strongly considered. And again, that's why the post of a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner is so necessary. The UK Government's Commissioner for the Retention and the Use of Biometric Materials, Professor Paul Wiles, is on record as saying that the bill places Scotland at the forefront of legislating for the oversight of biometric data in the field of criminal justice. He said, many other countries are interested in what Scotland's doing because they're all aware that they will have similar issues. Presiding officer, biometrics in its earliest form was the introduction of the use of criminal history, phot photographs and fingerprinting, which has been go going on for around 100 years. Those of us of a certain age can remember when DNA was introduced 30 years ago, how that revolutionised policing and crime detection. And we all marvelled at the technology that allowed more and more crimes to be solved. This scientific development has played a fundamental role in solving serious crimes such as murder and sexual offences. So we now move on to the more sophisticated and accurate biometric testing, and it's only logical for Scotland to have its own independent commissioner who will be appointed by the Parliament to ensure impartiality. Due to the fast-changing nature of this type of technology, the committee and the government have sought to keep certain aspects of the bill flexible enough to cope with technical advances. And due to the complexity and nature of the bill, it's been split into sections. It's impossible to discuss all aspects in a short speech, but I will try and highlight the, the main areas of discussion du during the evidence we heard. Sections two to five set out the functions and powers of the commissioner. The primary function of the commissioner will be to draft and promote a code of practice for the use of biometrics by the police and the SPA. The Commissioner will also play an important part in informing the views of policy and lawmakers responsible for making the law within, the, within, which, police, within which Police Scotland and the SPA operate. The contents of the Code of Practice will not be specified in the Bill to allow for flexibility and future proofing, as I said earlier. There was discussion over whether the Code should be mandatory and sanctions used if broken, and this was mentioned by uh, John Finney, and I know he feels strongly about this, um, rather than simply having regard to, and there is a strong argument for this, uh, and the committee has asked the government to review the effectiveness of this term as a working practice. In reality, the code of practice must be taken seriously, and any failure to observe it will need to be accompanied by good reason. There can also be legal consequences if it's not adhered to, such as a ju judicial review. Another aspect which was widely discussed during evidence was the jurisdiction and cross-border nature in some areas where we had to consider who would be accountable for the data and where ultimate responsibility would lie. The government believe it's for Police Scotland and the SPA to effectively manage the data which they've allowed to be uploaded into UK databases and to ensure records are managed effectively. The committee recommended that the National Crime Agency and the British Transport Police be included in the bodies set out in Section 7 of the Bill in relation to the functions in Scotland and asked that the Scottish Government bring forward the necessary amendment at Stage 2. The Cabinet Secretary spoke of this in his opening speech and uh, I welcome uh, those, those amendments coming forward. And of course there's an argument uh, to, to include public and private bodies um, as well as, as several member, members have mentioned. The Scottish Government are currently liaising, I understand, with different bodies and the UK Government on such matters, and this, as you say, is a work in progress. The Committee also make, recommended that the Commissioner for the Retention and Use of Biometric Material be added to the body set out in Section 3 to enhance the power of the Commissioner to work with others, and that the Forensic Science Regulator and Surveillance Camera Commissioner be added. In this respect, the Government, I believe, does favour a memorandum of understanding between the organisations which would signpost a complaints mechanism available to the public, which the government supports, but stresses that this would be between the new commissioner and the UK commissioner to agree. The com committee also recommended the setup of an ethics advisory group 
uh, and, is, and is open to cons the Scottish Government is open to considering wider views on the remit and membership for this group and to whom the group should report. The Government believes it's important that the remit, the remit is scoped to ensure relevance and its members have the appropriate skills and experience. As the convener mentioned, the committee did recommend that a complaints mechanism should be included in the bill, but the government believed the commissioner's role should be one of strategic oversight rather than to deal with the resolution of individual complaints. But I'm sure this will again be um, fleshed out at, at further stages of the bill. So in conclusion, presiding officer, there are areas of detail still to be determined in the bill, which will of course be addressed at stage two, but this is essentially a good bill which will greatly enhance crime prevention and detection, and I wholeheartedly support its general principles at stage one. Thank you. Call Shona Robson to be followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm uh, pleased to speak in this debate and support the general principles of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. And like others, I would like to thank the, the clerks and the Bill team for all their work so far. It has been a, an interesting experience looking at this Bill uh, on the Justice Committee and certainly expanding my knowledge of all matters biometrics. Um, I think the key point though is that we have to recognise that technological advances have brought huge benefits to the police in detecting, preventing and prosecuting crime. And of course, the, the aim here is to ensure the effective use of the biometric technology by the police in a, a, matter, a manner that is ethical and respects fundamental rights and freedoms. So there is a, a balancing act there. And of course, the, the role of the, the commissioner and the code of practice, I think, will help to maintain public confidence in how biometric technologies and data are used by the, the police in uh, crime uh, detection. Uh, obviously, as others have, have mentioned, the, the background uh, of this uh, emanates from the Independent Advisory Group report on the use of biometric data in Scotland. And the report pointed out that, of course, there was no current, there's currently no independent governance or oversight of the use of biometric data in policing in Scotland. And in deciding whether an independent biometrics commissioner would be necessary, obviously they had regard to the presumption against uh, new public bodies in Scotland, but considered that there was no body uh, within the, the competence of the Scottish Parliament to which oversight in this area could be given. So during its work, the IAG received several submissions which suggested several possible aspects to the commissioner's role, which we've heard so far in this debate. Uh, the development of a code of practice relating to the handling of biometric data and holding bodies to account for following the rules um, set out, of course, was a, a key one. There was also the, uh, the recommendation to, that the commissioner should be able to begin investigations from their own mandate, uh, that there should ha they should have an independent uh, complaints mechanism, and, of course, that they should, the commissioner should report to Parliament uh, and publish uh, regular reports uh, of their work. I also think an important element uh, that was uh, mentioned by the IAG was that the Commissioner should have a, a role to play in public education and public engagement, which has been touched upon during the debate. But it was felt that one of the areas where the public is um, sometimes frustrated is on the delivery of clear, jargon-free information to allow them to understand the powers which authorities have, the, the powers which the public have to hold authorities to account and how to exercise those powers. And I do hope that a key role of the Commissioner will be in this respect of engagement with the public uh, as we go forward. I certainly uh, welcome uh, some of the Cabinet Secretary's uh, commitments. So, uh, oh, firstly, on the, um, the recommendation that there should be an ethics advisory group on biometrics in Scotland, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to form uh, an ind independently chaired reference group to scope the possible legal and ethical issues arising from emerging technological developments. I think that is welcome. Uh, in terms of the conclusions of the Stage 1 report, uh, as has been um, set out um, so far, there has been a, a bit of a, a debate um, around the scope of this bill. 
uh, and that is something that the committee heard uh, a good deal of evidence on and has been debated here this afternoon. Um, clearly, there um, have been uh, some who have called for the extension of the bill very widely indeed, not uh, some uh, less so to other parts of the justice system, whether it's the Scottish Prison Service or uh, you know, CCTV systems and so on, but others have called on it to uh, be applied to private sector users of biometrics as well as private sector <coughs> technology developers uh, whose work drives the development of new biometrics data. And while I have some sympathy with that, I do think that the phased approach and making sure that we get it right uh, for um, the, uh, uh, the justice system initially and particularly uh, policing is very important. And I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to extend the scope uh, to PARC. Uh, as I understand it, the Scottish Government has said that it may be appropriate in future to extend the Commissioner's oversight rule to cover other criminal justice related matters uh, and the bill includes a power to amend the resulting act in that regard. Uh, I also understand the government is, uh, will consider a consultation in due course about including further persons or bodies with criminal justice related functions within the scope of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner in relation to those functions and I think that strikes the right balance uh, at this uh, moment in time. Whether or not uh, in the future it goes further than that, I think we need to uh, enable and allow the commissioner to, uh, commissioner to get up and running and get their office up and running and then perhaps to revisit the scope of that uh, in due course. Um, there has been a, a, a debate about the statutory footing for the Code of Conduct. Um, I hear what the, the, men, the Cabinet Secretary said about the, the fact that the Code of Conduct itself has statutory underpinning, but it's the, the detail of which should be left flexible for the Commissioner to develop in consultation uh, with uh, bodies and, of course, importantly, the public. Um, and I think that probably, uh, again, strikes the right balance. As others have said, I think the work that is being done here in Scotland is of interest to other jurisdictions who are also wrestling with these issues as we see technology uh, developing at a pace. And I look forward, hopefully, to Scotland leading the way in this area, as I'm sure it will. Maurice Corey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome this stage one debate of the Scottish Biometric Commissioner Bill this afternoon, and I'd also like to acknowledge the work of the Justice Committee in its scrutiny, along with the Clerk's support, and thank them all for this. Now, the Committee's report raised most helpful recommendations, and ones which I hope will be properly considered today. With the increasing use of biometric data, and particularly in the rise of second-generation biometrics, the need for a biometric commissioner in Scotland is absolutely clear. We now have a situation where biometric data has evolved and expanded from the collection of not just DNA, fingerprints and photographs alone, but enhanced facial recognition, software, social media information and voice pattern systems, amongst others. The legislation must reflect these changes, taking into account the sensitive nature surrounding data collection, and this is what this bill seeks to do. Of course, new biometric data opens up more opportunities for our police force. It can target the gaps in criminal proceedings with new ways of detecting criminal behavior through personal traits and advanced uh, movement technologies, for example. Um, for uh, victims of violent crime or sexual assault, such scientific developments can, in many cases, ensure that their cases reach a just close. Of course, I'm in favour of any advancement that equips our police force in Scotland to prevent crime to the best of their ability. Yet, while biometrics may pave the way for solving serious crime in the future, it is incredibly important that any new legislation considers the ethics of using such data and technology, and indeed the protection of human rights, personal security and privacy when gathering and storing data can pre present potentially serious obstacles that should not be ignored. With this in mind, the creation of a Scottish Biometrics Commissioner is a positive and necessary step forward. 
It is vital that such a position will allow, any, will allow for any biometric data policy in practice by Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to be kept under close review. In particular, I welcome the decision that this role will especially be mindful of how young people and those mo most vulnerable might be impacted in the data gathering process. This oversight would encourage a greater level of protection and accountability for those that need it most. And I'm supportive of the flexible and independent nature of the Commissioner's role, particularly in relation to how they might consider new technologies and incorporate these into the criminal justice system as appropriate. And importantly, the role of the Biometrics Commissioner could, would also serve to create a public dialogue about our understanding of biometric data, particularly the second generation advancements, and how these might be used safely. Uh, ultimately, the use of biometrics in Scotland needs to be made clearer and with greater transparency. A Scottish biometrics commissioner would have to encourage a public conversation about how data is collected and how these practices can be effectively utilised overall without infringing upon human rights standards. Linked with this, I would welcome further discussion on the possibility of whether the biometrics commissioner's role would be widened to encompass the use of biometric data by other groups. Indeed, many witness Witness contributions included in the Justice Committee report felt that the public bodies such as the NHS, as well as some private companies, and also in need of essential oversight in how they collect and store biometrics data. Whilst I do accept that it may be best to start with the policing and justice remit at this stage, a clarification on whether the Commissioner's capacity might be expanded to include other groups in the future would be very much appreciated. And to gain public confidence in personal data protection, I believe the bill will be further strengthened with the inclusion of a complaint mechanism, as the Justice Committee has already recommended. Uh, we cannot expect the public to put their trust in the provision of a biometrics commissioner if the role does not allow for complaints referral. And if uh, issues are detected in Police Scotland or the SPA's handling of biometrics, the public need to be assured that a level of accountability is in place. Now, this would ensure the role of the Biometrics Commissioner is independent and efficient. And, of course, at the centre of our debate today is how ethical standards can be preserved. And, as we know, the independent advisory group for this bill recommended an, an ethics advisory group be created to work with the Commissioner and other key stakeholders. It, its role would be to encourage uh, ethical decisions are being made in the use, retention and disposal of biometrics. This was in response to there being no provision for such a group already contained within the bill, an oversight in my opinion, one which I am sure my colleagues share. Whilst I am aware that the Scottish Government has indicated it is working towards establishing this group in conjunction with the Commissioner's role, I find it concerning that this has not been clarified in the bill beforehand. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome this first stage of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. It sets out a much needed role alongside a code of practice which will ensure that personal data is handled in keeping with ethical standards. And I hope that the upcoming stages of the bill will address some of the issues raised within the Justice Committee's report so it can be as effective as possible. Thank you. Fulton McGregor, followed by Jenny Golden. Thank you, President Officer. It gives me pleasure to speak in this debate as a committee member on the Justice Committee that scrutinised the bill at stage one. And like others have already said, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the witnesses and the clerks who have undertaken so much work on this bill. And I suppose to add uh, something else, um, to pay tribute to the clerks for the work they're doing on all the bills, because the Justice Committee, as I'm sure you will know, uh, President Officer, is a very busy committee indeed, and the clerks uh, definitely have their work cut out there. It's great um, also that there's been cross, um, broad cross-party uh, consensus on the bill, with the committee agreeing to the general principles in its stage one report. And there's no doubt that we need this bill now. Te as others have said, technological advances have brought massive benefits to policing in recent times and helped to keep us all safe. This bill and the creation of a commissioner will help to ensure that the use of biometric data is effective, lawful and ethical. And of the areas that the committee considered in greater depth, there are three that I want to focus my remarks on today. Uh, firstly, the increasing the scope of the commissioner. Secondly, the creation of an ethics panel. And then finally, the flexibility of the bill uh, to move with the times. These are all areas that have already been covered. Um, and broadly, there is a agreement. But in terms of the government response, I'll perhaps come uh, from a, a slightly different angle from maybe some of my colleagues on the committee have already um, done. 
Um, starting with uh, bringing in uh, others, I know Shona Robson uh, just talked about this um, a, a couple of minutes ago, and others have raised it, but one of the areas the committee did focus on was giving consideration to the scope of the Commissioner, uh, and we did recommend that the National Crime Agency, the BTP, um, be included in the bodies set out in uh, Section 7.1 and Section 3 of the Bill. Uh, I do note in the response, the Scottish Government is considering the inclusion of uh, these bodies and also the Ministry of Defence Police, and the discussions are ongoing. And the Cabinet Secretary states that a Section 104 order under the Scotland Act 1998 would be the most appropriate mechanism for conferring duties on such bodies, and it is not possible then to include um, to bring that through uh, as a stage two amendment. And I, I welcome that response because it was one of the more debated um, aspects at the Bill of Air Consideration at Stage One, and I, I feel it's, it, that it's brought um, clarity. Uh, we also recommended that the Commissioner for the retention a use of biometric material, the Forensic Science Regulator and the Surveillance Camera, camera Commission uh, be added to Section 3 of the Bill. And I note and welcome the Government are considering this and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could expand further on any current thoughts uh, he and the Government had, have ahead of Stage 2 uh, when summing up today, if he has time. Um, I do note that overall the Scottish Government is clear that it may be appropriate in the future to extend the Commissioner's oversight role to cover other criminal justice related matters and that this will be consulted on and, and again... Uh, I welcome that. In relation to the, the ethics panel, President Officer, uh, we've already heard uh, this is another area of some discussion. Uh, it was around the ethics advisory group, and the committee believes that an ethics advisory group, which has established to support the Commissioner, must be independent from government, and that its membership should be a matter for the Commissioner. Um, Amnesty International, indeed, um, in their briefing, state that the use of biometrics has the potential to breach human rights, such as the right to privacy, freedom of association and the right to peaceful assembly. And they also go on to talk about facial recognition that I know John, Sw um, John Finney um, also talked about. But I think it's important um, that their uh, quote is brought in here because this is an important aspect of having an ethics panel. Again, I know a very positive response from the Cabinet Secretary uh, in his commitment to establish such a group, which he uh, articulated um, at committee uh, on several occasions during stage one also. Uh, on his appearance um, and also accept the detailed explanation for why this might not be best achieved through primary legislation, which includes it is not what the, the IAG recommended in 2018, nor uh, is the equivalent group in England and Wales a statutory group, and I know that that group was uh, referenced quite regularly. Um, there are fears that such a move may be premature and lead to the lack of fle flexibility, which I think we all agree is important in this piece of legislation. And that the, Scottish Government would prefer more time as it intends to consult to obtain a wide degree of views about the best way forward to ensure that the remit is relevant and has the members with appropriate skills and experience. And I think that's a fair enough request from the Government um, that, that if it feels there's more time to consult that we should take that seriously. Um, and that also that lessons from the Emerging Technologies Advisory Group which will be established early this year, uh, we could learn some lessons from that given there will be similar remits. So I think that the, these these are reasons which uh, have convinced me in relation to this uh, recommendation the committee made. The final um, area of presiding officer was the flexibility to move with the times, which I think is, is very, very important. The committee discussed this um, in great depth, and um, the many, many witnesses uh, brought it up as well. I think it's, it's very important, given the rapid change of technology that we've already talked about uh, in the field of biometrics. And again, as I say, this is a point noticed by uh, noted by many witnesses. Um, again, I welcome that the government is uh, content to bring forward uh, an amendment at stage two, and perhaps again, um, given just the initial response that the cabinet secretary sent to the committee and the, the recommendations, perhaps he could expand on any early thoughts around this in, uh, in his summing up. And um, I would also note the calls from the law society in their briefing that, to, that we need to ensure that the commissioner's role is appropriately funded. Uh, on an ongoing basis in order to ensure any change in remit. Because I think we all expect, there's nobody um, here who has spoken today who doesn't expect that this is a role that's going to need to be flexible. It's going to need to change as technology changes in order that we can um, have an ethical um, and flexible approach um, to this. So um, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, in conclusion, President officer, I think this is a good bill. Uh, there are clearly things that are going to be debated further at stage two. Um, to, to make it better again, that's the, the point of having this process. Um, I think this has been a good, quite consensual uh, debate today and I would encourage Parliament to agree the principles at stage one.
The last of the open debate contributions is from Jenny Gilders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start by thanking the clerks of the Justice Committee, the Bill Team, and to all the witnesses from whom the Committee took evidence ahead of today's Stage 1 debate. Now, as we've already heard today, biometrics is the technical term for a strand of biology which applies statistical analysis and measure. And many of us will use some form of biometrics on a daily basis, from entering this building to the facial recognition technology used to unlock our mobile phones. As the Stage 1 report notes, over the past 30 years, this type of technology has become key in detecting and prosecuting crime. Indeed, because biometrics are non-transferable and difficult to falsify, their growing importance in the justice system cannot be underplayed. Advances in technology have created many benefits for our modern-day justice system, and the role of the new independent commissioner has therefore become of essential importance in overseeing police use of personal information, in addition to maintaining public trust in its ethical use. As the committee notes, the creation of this role is both timely and necessary. As was mentioned by Shona Robison, the need for a biometrics commissioner independent of government was also a key recommendation in the 2018 Independent Advisory Group report, which noted there should be legislation to create an independent Scottish biometrics commissioner. The commissioner should be answerable to the Scottish Parliament and report to Parliament. The commissioner should keep under review the acquisition, retention, use and disposal of all biometric data by the police, SPA and other public bodies. Whilst technological advances in biometrics have undoubtedly brought huge benefits to policing, they have also created challenges for governments globally, as it can be difficult for legislation to keep pace. As Amnesty note in their briefing ahead of today's debate, effective regulation of those technologies is a significant challenge that governments across the globe are grappling with as technology evolves faster than regulatory frameworks. And we remain open-minded about how best effective regulation can, can, can achieve to ensure all biometric technology use is in line with international human rights. On the issue of human rights, as I think was also mentioned by my colleague Rona Mackay, HMICS uh, asserted that the role of the Commissioner creates an opportunity in Scotland to explore emerging human rights and ethical considerations around the use of biometrics data. And indeed, as the Commissioner for the Retention and Use of Biometric Materials summed up the challenges of new technological advances in his 2018 annual report, he said, we are seeing the rapid exploration and deployment by the police of new biometric technologies and new data analysis. Some of these will improve the quality of policing and will do so in a way that is in the public interest. However, some could be used in ways that risk and damage the public interest, for example, by reinforcing biases of which reinforcement is not in the public interest. If the benefits of these new technologies are to be achieved, there needs to be a process that provides assurance that the balance between those benefits and risk between benefits and loss of privacy are being properly managed. As such, the committee asked the government to consider how um, a perceived lack of debate around transparency and the use of biometrics across Scotland might be addressed. And I note in the government's response that they accept the Commissioner as an independent office holder will, once appointed, be best placed to lead any debate on the level of transparency on the use of biometrics for criminal justice and police purposes. The financial memorandum states that Commissioner's role will be a part-time one, estimated to be 0.6 full-time equivalent, and the Commissioner is to be supported by three full-time staff. And on this, the committee heard some debate uh, in evidence sessions as to whether or not the position should be enhanced to a full-time role. Detective Chief Superintendent uh, Sean Scott advised it will be an extremely busy role. It is a burgeoning area of business and there is so much to do. Extending the code of practice into other areas will be a huge task, so full-time might be the best option. However, Tom Nelson, Director of Forensic Services at the Scottish Police Authority, advised that whilst a full-time role was in operation in England, that individual's role covers a total of 43 forces. And as such, he concluded a 0.6 full-time equivalent is probably reasonable given the size of Scotland compared to England and Wales. In response to my line of questioning, Mr Nelson also explained that a lot depended on the level of staffing available to the Commissioner. I also raised this issue with Professor Paul Wiles, who noted that I think the role will be part-time due to a combination of the amount of time the Commissioner is envisaged as providing and the extent to which his or her office can help in that process. It is a team effort rather than just being a single person. As Liam Kerr mentioned earlier, the need for public confidence and trust in the use of biometrics by the police and criminal justice system is essential. And as such, the committee concluded that the Scottish Government includes a complete mechanism within the bill to enable the public to refer issues to the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner on the use of biometrics by Police Scotland and the SPA or on their lack of compliance with the Code of Practice. And I note from the Government's response, however, that um, as the Commissioner's role is intended to be one of strategic oversight as opposed to resolution of any individual complaints, the Scottish Government um, has asserted 
asserted that this responsibility should instead rest with the Information Commissioner. Uh, the Government also mentions, however, the development of a fully comprehensive communication strategy which would help the public understand the Commissioner's role. I think that's certainly very welcome. Presiding officer, the, the evidence that the, Scottish, uh, the Justice Committee rather received on the establishment of the Biometrics Commissioner has been broadly supportive, as we've heard today. Uh, and indeed, the Commissioner for the Retention and the Use of Biometrics Materials, Professor Wells, stated the bill places Scotland at the forefront of legislating for the oversight of biometrics data in criminal justice. And on that positive note, I will conclude, presiding officer. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call James Kelly for around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think um, so it's been an interesting debate. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of consensus around the establishment, support for the general principles of the bill and the establishment of a biometrics um, commissioner. Uh, and their contributions, Hamza Yusuf and Liam Kerr, both emphasised the need for uh, public confidence in the role of the Biometrics Commissioner. And I think in actual fact, that's a good test for some of the arguments that played out during the course of the afternoon. So, you know, one of the, the, the areas that where there's been some disagreement between the committee and the Cabinet Secretary is around the, the scope of the Commissioner's role uh, initially in the bill it's drafted uh, as it will cover Police Scotland and the SPA. The Cabinet Secretary has helpfully extended that to PERC and uh, the British Transport Police. Um, during the course of the debate, um, people have argued that it should be extended to public bodies such as the NHS and private companies. Shona Robson uh, argued for a, a, a staged approach uh, supporting the uh, what had been outlined by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Maurice Corey was interested in testing that further, and John Finney uh, wanted to move you know, much further down the line and take on board private companies. Listening to the arguments this afternoon and also the evidence at committee, I'm more persuaded to be more along the line of where John Finney is. Uh, I understand the point Shona Robson was making about staging it, but I think this is an important uh, role that we're establishing here and because of the way that this, the data the, and the collection techniques and the use of technology expands uh, quickly and particularly the way private companies are picking up on issues like facial recognition technology, I think it's, it's something that we need to be more robust on, uh, on, on the, the, the face of the bill. I think in terms, uh, again, in, in that, again, that test against public confidence, I think we need to go further than has been outlined so far uh, by Hamza Yusuf in order to instill public confidence in the approach that, that, that we will finally want to agree. Uh, similarly, in relation to uh, powers, um, Margaret Mitchell you know, very strongly made the case on behalf of the committee that there should be more compliance in terms of the code of practice. Um, again, there was a lot of discussion about this phrase, have regard to, and whether that, that was strong enough. Uh, and I just think in, that if you really want public confidence, you need to go further than simply saying you've got to have regard to the, the matters that are within uh, the code. Um, in terms of uh, access, again, if you want your public confidence, you need to have a strong uh, complaints process there that uh, the public uh, are able to, to enlist in. So I think the points that have been made by a number of contributors uh, around making amendments to include uh, a complaints process uh, are, are very much true. I think some of the, the other points that were brought out um, around the code of practice, I think it's key that uh, in relation to um, approval of that code of practice, uh, the approval, uh, bearing in mind the wide-reaching consequences of it, the approval should be by Parliament and not by Ministers. Uh, and I think that was a point that the committee uh, felt strongly on. Uh, 
other points that come out during the, the course of the debate, uh, a number of people, Liam MacArthur, Rona Mackay, uh, and I think Maurice Corey also, or sorry, Fulton McGregor spoke about the, the ethics advisory group. And the, you know, I think Liam MacArthur made the point very strongly about the absence of that from the, the initial bill. And uh, again, I think bearing in mind the issues that we're dealing with here in terms of data collection, uh, I think it's important that proper regard is given to the establishment of uh, an ethics advisory group. I think another important point that John Finney made was around this potential gap there is in the, the legislation around retention of data. And we heard some evidence about this at committee that potentially uh, there might be data that's been, been held uh, which there's not a proper legal basis for holding. So I would hope that the government separate to this legislation would ensure that uh, there's a, an appropriate legal basis put in place to ensure that if any data has been collected that it's then uh, deleted once its uh, retention period uh, has been reached because it's absolutely crucial that people's human rights shouldn't be compromised. So in summing up, I, th I think it's actually been an interesting debate this afternoon because there have been some differences that have been brought to the fore in a, you know, in a, a, a reasonable and considerate manner. And I'm quite sure that the Cabinet Secretary, being the reasonable and considerate person that he is, will take on board some of the changes that members have suggested uh, ahead of the stage two consideration of the bill. Now call Gordon Linters for up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it is perhaps not just a conservative instinct, and I say conservative with a small c in this consensual debate, but also a human instinct to stand up for the individual, to check the power of the state and to prevent governments or its agencies from overstepping their bounds. So I welcome measures which seek to prevent unnecessary intrusion into the lives of ordinary Scots. As has been so eloquently said by my colleague, Maurice Corey, legislation needs to reflect the technological progresses we have made. It should, of course, support the police in carrying out their duties in all circumstances and using new technology where appropriate in their task. But as with all technologies or techniques, new or old, the public must be protected from any misuse or abuse of these, and their use must submit to the rule of law and respect for individual dignity. With this in mind, Parliament will no doubt require to revisit the issues which arise in the course of this debate uh, in both the public and private field as we move into the future. And others in this debate have already uh, commented on this, and I, I think I can do no better than James Kelly, who already did a superb, superb roundup of individual contributions. I shan't repeat that. So if this legislation contributes to respect for these principles, the Office of the Commissioner may take a leading role in the future to promote a greater understanding of personal biometric data and how it affects us, prevent overreach and balance what Police Scotland have termed the, and I quote, compete, competing concerns of public benefit. But, as also has been highlighted, key issues do remain. Uh, first among these is the approach any newly created commissioner would take to working jointly with the UK commissioner created in 2012. In its stage one report, the Parliament's Justice Committee heard evidence from the Law Society of Scotland that the bill doesn't specify how the Scottish Commissioner would interact with his or her UK counterpart. Will, for example, Scotland's policy, having as it does a separate judicial system and police service diverge distinctly from UK policy, how will this affect cooperation on joint competencies? All of these questions arise, and I do note the Cabinet Secretary's comments on various cross-border bodies in his opening remarks, but I think that greater clarification regarding how information sharing obligations and oversight between the two offices and how this will work will surely be needed. 
and that not least in light of cross-border considerations when it comes to terrorism and organized crime. Turning to another issue, the UK Commissioner Paul Wiles has told us that his mandate to monitor and publicly report is enough to ensure compliance. This bill, of course, goes a step further by giving his Scottish counterpart the power to require provision of information, but it does not grant the Commissioner power to sanction public bodies found to be in breach of any proposed policy on biometrics. Now, my colleague Liam Kerr and also Margaret Mitchell as convener of the committee have rightly pointed to the committee's view on enforcement being weak and to the lack of a complaints procedure which will not bolster public confidence. Against the background of Scotland having a single unitary police force, there is perhaps more potential here for unintentional overreach in these areas than if we had multiple forces across the country. And there is less scope for performative comparison by benchmarking in Scotland compared to the decentralized police authorities in England and Wales. There, scrutiny of standards from an enforcement perspective can be exercised by comparative means. And I think that supports the committee's conclusion that a code of practice should be included in subordinate legislation to the bill. Naming and shaming will hardly be adequate to ensure compliance. So serious and legitimate concerns have been raised in evidence before the committee about lack of legal enforceability in the bill as currently drafted. So finally, for today's purposes and against that background, given the framework set out in the bill, I turn to the provision in section 12.3b, which to me seems both unclear and extraordinary in some ways. In general terms, section 11 on the commissioner's power to gather information appears to be unobjectionable, apart perhaps from subsection 11.3. Section 12, likewise, by providing a means to enforce the Commissioner's powers through the recourse to the Court of Session, also appears to make sense, apart, again, from one part of it, subsection 12.3b. Now, the difficulty, as I see it, with subsection 11.3 is that the definition of what the information may or may not be referred to in that subsection is what is called in the courts a moot point and can depend on a multiplicity of factors. That causes an immediate lack of clarity as to what information it is referring to there when it uh, comments on information which a person would be entitled to refuse to provide in proceedings in a court in Scotland. However, the major point, I think, is section 12.3b, which gives the Court of Session power to deal with a failure to provide information to the Commissioner as, and I quote, if, as if it were a contempt of court. The words, as if it were, summarize the problem with it. It isn't. So is the bill seeking to set up the commissioner as a quasi-judicial figure? I think, if so, that that is a bad thing, because confusing roles and powers that individuals acting in public offices possess is, again, I think, a bad thing. Contempt of court, of course, carries up to two years imprisonment as a penalty to deal with in the normal course, for example, failures to obtemper or carry out orders of a court. And it is not something that should be extended lightly. In short, it should not be extended to doing something which is not a failure in relation to a court, but rather someone else. So I think it would be helpful, therefore, if the Cabinet Secretary could perhaps explain a bit more this provision, and in particular point to, if he can in the course of this debate, specific other examples where conduct which is not contempt of an actual court may be treated as if it were under existing legislation in other areas. But in closing, may I agree that this bill can provide a very useful counterpoint to the emerging threat of a biometric avalanche, and on that basis, I, as indeed others who have spoken here, am supportive of it. I now call Hamza Yousaf to uh, wind up the debate. If you could take us up to five to five, that would be useful, which leaves some time for interventions, and I'm sure there will be a few. I'll do my very best. 
um, presiding officer. Can I thank members who have uh, contributed to this afternoon's uh, debate? It's been a very uh, healthy debate. It's been very constructive, but quite rightly, it has been uh, very challenging. And uh, of course, I would expect uh, nothing less given the subject matter. Uh, some of those issues I've been very familiar with. I have to say the issues raised by Gordon Lundhurst, previously by Liam Kerr around the contempt of court, uh, are ones that I'll take away and give in further consideration uh, and either write to the members or address it perhaps in stage two. So some of these issues that have been raised uh, are ones that haven't been in my consideration thus far. So I thank members uh, for raising them with me. I'm also encouraged that the lead committee's endorsement of the bill uh, has been reflected uh, in, in the debate. Uh, the bill covers a broad range of fundamental questions. Um, how do we best keep communities safe while respecting the rights of the individuals? How do we best ensure that we hold the most personal of data in an effective, proportionate and ethical manner? How do we ensure that this draft legislation and associated procedures are future-proof to enable us to respond to technological advances in the digital age? And how do we best ensure that the public are aware uh, of their rights? Equally uh, importantly, do, do, how do we ensure that they know who to turn to should they have concerns? These are just some of uh, the most basic but actually fundamental questions that each of us has to ask in relation to this bill. And many uh, of those who have contributed uh, have attempted to answer uh, those questions. It would, of course, be very unusual at uh, stage one of any bill for it to achieve complete consensus. There is, of course, consensus that uh, we should move, uh, we should agree the principles and move on to stage two. Uh, but there are, of course, differences uh, across the chamber and challenges to the government, which I've heard uh, very loudly and clearly from uh, right across uh, the chamber. And I'm going to try to address uh, some of those uh, issues, if I can, one by one. And of course, if I have time, I'm more than happy to take uh, inter interventions. Uh, clearly, if I omit any of the fundamental questions, uh, members can uh, intervene and ask me should they wish to do so. I, I thought I'd address the issue uh, of complaint handling, first of all, that was raised uh, almost virtually by, by, by every member, uh, but uh, first and foremost by uh, the convener and, and, and her response, and uh, it's been mentioned in the committee uh, as well. I, I, I mean, a fair amount of consideration was given in the drafting of this bill and in the consideration of this bill to the non-duplication of roles uh, in terms of the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner, but also uh, the UK Information Commissioner. Um, the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner role was very much seen as a complement to the role of the Information Commissioner. So there is currently, uh, and it's worth just reiterating and stressing this, there is currently an avenue to make a complaint about the handling of data which can be investigated. That can happen uh, right here, right now, by a member of the public in Scotland, the role of the Biometrics Commissioner is designed not to duplicate that. Uh, the work of the ICO, the Information Commissioner Office, is driven by complaints from individuals, uh, individual members of the public. That is the bread and butter of what they do. That's the thrust of the work uh, of the ICO. But the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner's remit will be driven by identifying systemic deficiencies. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion with the ICO uh, there's been a lot of discussion with the ICO about the complementarity of the roles. Uh, and the ICO very much welcomes uh, the creation of the new biometrics uh, commissioner. I, I agree with what many members uh, have said. I think Liam Kerr made reference to this in, 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 in his remarks, that, that we don't want to lose public trust, public confidence. We want to maintain that. Uh, and therefore, making it very clear about where complaints should be directed will be hugely uh, important. Uh, I would envisage that the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner uh, may wish to develop a fully comprehensive communication strategy but, uh, about what their role uh, is. But above and beyond that, I think it would be very important for the two... Uh, in just one, one second, I will, I will give way in just a second. I think it would, be, it would make sense for the two commissioners to agree a memorandum uh, of understanding, to aid understanding of their respective roles to confirm that members of the public wishing to complain about the handling of the biometric data would take a complaint to the ICO. Uh, Scottish Government officials have had a number of discussions with the ICO who have indicated their willingness to enter into uh, a memorandum of understanding of that sort. And I give way to James Kelly. James Kelly. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Uh, I agree with the point that you don't want duplication, but it, it would seem logically if what we're doing is setting up a biometrics commissioner where 
a specific code of practice uh, which pertains specifically to the role of the collection and retention of biometric data in Scotland that logically, if people have an issue with any of that process, then they would want to come, more, come directly to the Biometrics Commissioner as opposed to going to the Information Commissioner. That just seems a logical thing from my point of view. Secretary. I, I don't disagree with James Kelly that there could be, uh, what he's alluding to, that there could be an element of, of confusion about who you go to. But again, if I just give you a practical example, uh, you know, in, in terms of one that we'll deal with in our everyday life as MSPs, uh, you know, I know that I have constituents that come into my constituency office, which I share with, with, with my colleague, the MP, um, and they'll come in on, on, on reserve matters and they'll speak to me first and foremost at my surgery. I'll pass their details on if it's to do with the DWP or an immigration case, often to the MP. Uh, and, and, and I inform my constituent of that. And the constituent, I've never had an issue where the constituent has ever complained about the fact that I've passed on their details, uh, of course, with their permission uh, to do so, uh, and for that to be then pursued by the MP to hopefully get a satisfactory outcome. Uh, but that is, uh, and there can be in a confusion about what an MSP uh, deals with, what a councillor deals with, what an MP deals with. Um, but so long as there's almost a seamless transition uh, to the right point of contact uh, to deal with that complaint or that concern, then really I think is, there, is, is, is an issue. So I think this memorandum of understanding between the two commissioners is, is the right way to, to, to approach it. My other concern about the complaint handling, and I, and I am going to be, I should have said this from, from the very beginning, I'm going to of course be absolutely open-minded to all the suggestions made by uh, members uh, across the chamber, but my concern would also be that potentially we could be out of scope because uh, the ICO uh, very much uh, has that reserved function um, of, 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 of data protection and investigation of complaints. So, uh, again, I will, I will give careful consideration. The, the, other, the other point uh, that was raised by members across the chamber quite consistently, uh, right across uh, the chamber, um, was the having regard to clause uh, in uh, the bill. Uh, and, and I hear very carefully what John Finney uh, was saying uh, with James Kelly, uh, Liam Kerr made the point. Uh, in fact, uh, a number of uh, those who contributed made the point about having regard to and, and saying, look, why don't you just make it compli compliance at the beginning instead of having regards to and then perhaps uh, reviewing it uh, in the future. I, I do understand that the Parliament wishes to ensure that Scotland, uh, Police Scotland and the SPA adhere to the code uh, of practice. Um, it's important to know that any provision that would force them to comply with the code will in effect create a general regulatory regime in relation to the processing of biometric data by those bodies. Uh, given that biometric data can also be personal data, uh, my concern would be that such a regulatory regime would cut across data protection law, which is reserved, uh, and again, maybe outside uh, the legislative uh, competence uh, of the bill. All that having been said, um, I'm happy to consider the committee's recommendation to review the have regards to provision, uh, mindful that government and parliament do carry out post-legislative scrutiny on the commissioner's power at any time without any further legislative provision uh, being required. But um, I hear pretty loud and pretty clear uh, that there is some real concern by members right across the chamber. I think that is very sincere uh, concern with members across the chamber and so let me give an absolute assurance that before stage two, uh, let me give some reflection upon the points that have been made uh, by each of uh, the justice spokespeople uh, and by uh, the convener as well. Uh, the other issue that's been mentioned uh, has been one uh, around scope. Uh, and, and, and is it possible, uh, for example, to extend the scope uh, beyond policing or beyond Police Scotland? <coughs> Excuse me. My view is that it would be possible to extend the bill uh, within the overarching purpose of criminal justice and police purposes in order to include uh, either private sector bodies or other Scottish public authorities which operate in this field. Uh, indeed, the bill already expressly includes the power to do this by regulations, which would allow this to be done once the Commissioner's office is up and running. Yes. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. Uh, Cameron Secretary, if we accept that the scope could extend, then is the Cameron Secretary able to give any greater reassurance over resourcing uh, at this stage? Is I worry that his response to paragraph 266 in the letter that we received might not inspire confidence amongst potential candidates for the role? 
Member Secretary. Prime resourcing, uh, let me say that obviously the bill accompanied with it is a financial memorandum, but on top of that, when the question was asked about whether or not <coughs> the resourcing was adequate in comparison to the English Commissioner, uh, the view was that it's actually very, very similar in, in, in comparison. So I don't envisage that there's, a, at the moment, a resource challenge. Clearly, if the scope was extended, I'll, I'll expand on this point, then there may well be a resource implication. Of course, the government at that point uh, would absolutely have to look at that. We wouldn't look to extend the scope of a commissioner uh, if there was any concerns about resourcing. Uh, they would have to be made uh, very obvious, uh, very upfront in that process. I should say, any, any move to extend the Commissioner's role would require development of a substantive case for change, uh, supported by an appropriate evidence base uh, and, and indeed by a public consultation. I will keep an open mind as to broadening of the Commissioner's remit in the future to include other public bodies, but this would be, and I should say this very firmly, very much uh, after the new Commissioner has had time to bed in and after a period of consultation. I think that would be the appropriate uh, way to do it. <coughs> One of the other issues raised, uh, presiding officer, uh, by Lee MacArthur, uh, but also raised again by a number of other uh, members, was the issue of the Ethics Advisory Group. Uh, I note the committee's wish to see the Ethics Advisory Group established on a statutory footing and being appointed by the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner for the purpose of supporting the Commissioner. However, this is at odds with the IAG's recommendation which Scottish Ministers have already committed to implementing. Let me be clear, I fully support the formation of an ethics advisory group. I recognise that it can make a valuable contribution to our collective understanding of the key ethical, legal and technical issues arising from the use of biometric data in policing and criminal justice. And I fully intend to honour that commitment that was made in 2018. But I remain unconvinced of the need to place this group on the face of the bill. The committee's report does not make clear why a statutory footing is required. I note that the IAG did not ask for the group to be statutory. I also note that the Biometric and Forensic Working Group for England and Wales, which the Stage 1 report and the IAG both reference, is also not a statutory group. So I therefore ask members to reconsider or explain more fully perhaps their position on that. I'm very open <coughs> excuse me, to wider reviews on the remit and the membership for this group and to whom the group should report. The IAG called for a consultation to explore the options uh, and this is what uh, I, I absolutely uh, want to do. There were a, a number of other uh, issues uh, that were raised, uh, presiding officer, but those were certainly uh, the most uh, fundamental. I, I will reflect carefully on some of the challenges that members have raised in relation to the biometrics bill uh, if this Parliament is content to approve the principles of the Bill, of course I shall work with the committee and committee members to amend it as appropriate and to assure it achieves what we want it to achieve. I'm happy, presiding officer, uh, to commend this motion to the Parliament uh, and move it uh, in my name. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes stage one debate on the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. Uh, I'm minded to take, if no one objects, taking a Motion without notice to move forward decision time till now. Can I ask the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move such a motion? Thank you very much. So the question is that decision time be moved to now. Are we all in agreement? Yes. We are. That's great. There's only one question uh, today, and the question is that motion 20331, in the name of Hamza Youssef, on stage one of the Scottish, Commissioner Bill, Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.